Oh, I'm sorry. Did I break your concentration? Somewhere between science and superstition. We have such sights to show you. Strange. Eons. Welcome to Strange Eons Radio. That's Eric Morgret over there. Hello. That's Tony Kay sitting in for Vanessa over there. Hello. I'm Kelly Young. Hey, Tony. Glad to have you back. How you been? I'm good, and I'm delighted to be back. Last week was a lot of fun. I, I loved uh, sailing the seven haunted seas <laughs> with you guys. Oh, well, I'm glad you think so. We got a lot of negative response <laughs> to you being on the show, so this is probably going to be the last time well, for you. Well, to quote Oliver Reed, my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, guys, I started watching on Amazon Prime Hunters with Al Pacino. Anybody else? I saw the billboard. This, this <laughs> is bonkers, this. and I fucking love it. Uh, if you're going in hoping to get some kind of serious look at Nazi hunters in 1977 New York, you may be disappointed because this is ridiculous, over-the-top uh, Tarantino-style oh, storytelling. Awesome. Even uh, it sounds better. So it's less judgment at Nuremberg and more boys from Brazil. It's boys from Brazil if Tarantino directed it. Ooh, it's good Lord. Uh, Al Pacino <laughs> has the most over the top Jewish accent in the world. If you if you had somebody actually come up and start talking to you this way, you'd be like, "Why are you talking like that?" <laughs> <laughs> it's the worst Jewish accent. Uh, what the hell? I don't understand. It's like that. I need to find the. These Nazis here. Uh, what are you going to you going to tell eighty year old Al Pacino how to act? Yeah, exactly. I, I think that as a director, you just go, "All right, cut, print." All right, Al Pacino's channeling Mel Brooks. This right. is good. Right. The lead is a young kid, and I, I can't remember his name offhand, but he looks like a very young Richard Dreyfus, and he holds his own with a, a lot of very seasoned actors some pretty crazy stuff maybe even thoughtless stuff because it's such a heavy topic and then they will throw in a uh, a 1970s movie trailer version of introducing the characters oh wow so it, it gets just kind of weird but wow for me uh having not had to live through world war ii I'm able to swallow all this and just go, give me more. Um, I, your mileage may vary, but I love it. Cool. I'm that intrigued. Sounds, yeah, it sounds good. Cool. I do want to see that one. I had it on my list when I first saw the trailer going, okay, this looks like fun. It's, it's all about killing Nazis, and how can you not get behind that in every way? Amen, brother. There you go. How about you, Tony? Got anything interesting? Uh, been... Let me see. What, uh, what have I seen? Um, I did catch uh, Birds of Prey. In the oh, theater, okay. or the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn, I think is the title. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I honestly, I kind of loved it. Um, I, I know it is very divisive. I see, I, I see <laughs> Kelly shrinkling his nose because I'm sure he detested it. Um, but leads back. Takes I, a sip. <laughs> I, I was, v I was actually very taken by how cinema savvy it was. Give um, me that glass of wine back. <laughs> I haven't had enough of it, evidently. Um, no, I actually, I, I kind of loved it. I, I love uh, Margot Robbie's characterization of Harley Quinn, and I think it's phenomenal that she got her own vehicle. To me, it felt like a Ralph Bakshi cartoon um, written and directed by feminists. That was my take on the movie, and that was one of the yet, reasons so I... why I liked it quite a bit. It, there are points where it leans on the feminism button a little too hard, um, which is a shame because you see these characters, these female characters, like working together and having great chemistry established between one another, and they just punch a little too hard at the fact that at the girl power like stating it out loud instead of just letting it be told visually and through the natural like progression of the story so that was a little bit that was a little bit uh too on the nose for me but other than that i mean i thought the acting was i thought the acting was great i uh, i loved all of the shout backs to grindhouse cinema i mean geez you know the character of black mask is like he's introduced like a character from like one of those weird italian mad max ripoffs in the 80s you know <laughs> replete with like the grand music and him standing up there backlit you know and uh 
yeah, I just really enjoyed it. And I thought there, there's at least one action scene in there that I think is right up there with any with like the best of the last five years. And that's where she um, that's the, the scene where she storms the um, the prison and her rocket her grenade launcher or whatever is shooting out confetti and bean oh, bags. Right, right. See for me it, it worked. I really enjoyed it. That was the police department. I'm guessing when Thank that you. script was written, she was killing all those cops and probably they pulled back on that. I would imagine probably Which was good. I didn't mind all the feminism stuff. In fact I thought that was the best part of the film. I thought it was horribly miscast. I thought the, the young Asian girl was a bad actor or was at least directed to be bad. Uh, who's the gal who played the Huntress? Uh, Winstead, Mary Elizabeth Winstead. I have the biggest crush on her. She can do no wrong. I thought she was horrible in this. She was horribly miscast. And Margot Robbie is the character of Harley Quinn is someone that I think works in very small doses. And in a feature film, I hated her so much. <laughs> and her, her voice, I, I wanted to kill everybody who thought this was a good movie. Okay, well, including knife the fight. person <laughs> sitting That's next it. to me. I'm dead now. Did, did or maybe have, you're dead. Did she have long, extended, pointless shots of dirty feet? Over no, no, no. It, was no. A, it wasn't a Tarantino. It wasn't Tarantino. Okay. <laughs> That's just it. You know, I, I, I expected a lot from this film. I thought that the action scenes that you love so much felt like they came out of a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie. Uh, I thought they I, were very poorly well, directed. Especially when we've got stuff like John Wick coming out now, you can't do a John Wick style fight and make it look bad anymore. We as viewers just won't allow that. Well, most of us, those of us who have <laughs> the, those of us kind un of undiscerning, <laughs> undiscerning oafs, actually really enjoy it. I also, I also realize thumbs up, undiscerning oaf. <laughs> I also realize this movie was not made for me. I think it was aimed for fifteen-year-old girls. And I hope that uh, it gets that audience. And I, I, I'm not saying that you're a 15-year-old girl or that you have the mindset of a 15-year-old girl, just that you can appreciate that as a much, much older man. Very old. <laughs> Thanks. Love you. I, I feel like I should have seen this so I could, like, maybe you guys are... We a could point and Z, counter. and I'd be sitting there at M going, you know, well, all right, there's this, but yeah. no, I haven't seen it. I'll say this, Tony. You are in good company. There are a lot of people whose opinions I respect who really enjoyed this film. I just did not. I, I You know, I think part of it is the strength of um, diminished expectations. I really was not expecting much going in, and I was very pleasantly surprised. It's 100 times better than Suicide Squad, if that's what you're getting at. <laughs> yes, that is that is what I'm getting at. Yes, it is. Yeah, see, the people's opinions I generally respect. This one's a tough one because everybody I talked to hated Suicide Squad, so I didn't even bother to watch it. There's enough friggin' movies out there that, you know what, fuck it. This one now is kind of like, maybe I do want to watch this because it's so polarizing. I would say Although go it is, see this movie because if you want to support uh, women filmmakers, this is all that. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, it's, it's the same reason I hated Ghostbusters reboot and said you should go see it is if you want more of these kind of movies, then we've got to show it at the box office. Unfortunately, those of you who supported that shitty movie is why we got this movie. <laughs> but I, I but I, I prefer <laughs> Little Women. I went and I actually really enjoyed that. Film. I'm Thought certain it, it would have been good. much better. Yes. <laughs> so, so I'll go there. But the but now they're like, oh, maybe I will see it because it sits in the middle. Although, you know, we are talking better than Oscar winning Suicide Squad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Forever has that label. <laughs> Eric, what about you? What have you seen? <laughs> Tumbleweeds. <laughs> you know, a lot of times if we don't speak for a little while, I might trim that down and edit. That's that's staying in. Oh, good. Awkward uh, silence. It's rad. As I mentioned last week, I've got not a lot of time left and a whole crap ton of Crypticon oh, films no, what's, to watch. Oh, okay. Boy, this started uh, out. I know. Got not a lot of time left. <laughs> I forgot to get that memo. <laughs> <laughs> you know how you... Hey, that's a way to get ratings. By the way... That's right. You know how you revealed last week that you know you signed your lease on air without telling anybody. Right. I felt beforehand. like that was appropriate well, to reveal on air. <laughs> guess what? That was quite <laughs> dramatic. Yes. No, 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 no. So I haven't been watching a lot of anything that's not either directly for this or directly for Krypton. So I'm going to talk about a book, a writer. Cool. What are those? Yeah, exactly. Uh, have you ever read uh, Grandy Hendrix? 
Grandy or Grady? Grady. I mean, Grady Hendrix. I know the name, and I think I may have. Horror Store was probably one of his bigger ones where he wrote like a ghost story based in kind of an Ikea Like an Ikea, style yeah, yeah, yeah. That was actually a great book. His, I've recently read, picking it up, not even connecting who the writer was till I was like halfway through the book. He also wrote that book, uh, Paperbacks from Hell, about uh, 80s yes, paperbacks. Yes, okay, boy, that book is amazing. Uh, I was reading this one called We Sold Our Souls, which is about a band who uh, the lead singer talks most of the band into selling their souls. He goes on to huge, great success, while the lead guitarist, who is more the talent of the band, didn't sign. And she wants to come back and basically get back at the guy. It's a fucking amazing book. The ending of the book is a... This isn't a spoiler thing, because the whole entire book is leading to this moment, so you know it's going to happen, is them on stage performing. After reading the book, I felt like... Not that I had been to that concert, but I, I was on the stage with those people performing with it. He writes so wow. good. And so I immediately, after I finished that, realizing who it was, I really immediately picked up uh, My Best Friend's Exorcism, which is the story of uh, two teen girls and one of them gets possessed. But nobody knows she's possessed for a huge portion of the book. Again, an amazing story. Uh, 80, written in the uh, mid-80s time period and captures it fairly well uh, without making it overt. Like, hey, look, we're in the 80s, CC. Right, right. We're watching Miami Vice and drinking New York seltzer. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, it, but it still feels like that. So if you have any interest in reading books, which I feel most of us do. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Highly recommend just about anything by uh, Grady Hendrix because everything I've read has been really I've good. heard great things about We Sold, we sold Our Souls. So, Man, yeah. This, so is, this fits into, you know, how much I love the heavy metal horror yeah. genre. Oh, so yes. it, it feels a little bit like uh, Skip Inspector's The Scream and other stuff like that that I like. Yeah, yeah. I, w I would highly recommend it. I walked into, um, I was early for something. I was at downtown. I went into, um, oh, Elliott Bay Books. Right. And this was sitting there. I was like, what the hell is this book? And I looked at it. I was like, well, this sounds cool. So got it, you know read what? it, and it's I awesome. love that you still read physical books. Some, I go back and forth. I read okay. both now. I read both. But what, I do a lot of reading at night and being married. The little I never really liked those little bitty book lights or right, anything right. like that. So I'll read e-books at night. And then I still read physical books. I like <laughs> how you had to humble brag being married and shame Tony and I. I think I mentioned yeah. either of your status. <laughs> no, you were status. like, and uh, me being <clears throat> being married, <laughs> you guys probably wouldn't understand, but I sleep in a bed with a woman. <laughs> Although you didn't say it was a woman. so <laughs> You never know. <laughs> well, I'll just have to figure that out on your own. This is where the talk degenerates when Ves Vanessa's not around. <laughs> That's no, good to know. This Vanessa, is exactly how it goes when Vanessa's here. <laughs> well, too. actually, that's true. That's true. If there's not at least one sexual reference, it's not an episode that's of Strange right. Eons. That's right. Well, hey, guys, with that uncomfortable topic <laughs> it's past, strange. Let's, uh, let's take a little break. We'll find out what Mattress World has to sell us, and we will come right back with Tony's topic, which was black exploitation. Wash your hands, Roger. Wash your hands, Roger. Wash your hands, Roger. Yeah, wash your hands, Roger. Your mom got you something special. Lava. Lava's pumice gets them clean with one wash. Wash your hands, Roger. Show Daddy your hands, Roger. Well, for the first time they're clean. Mom knows. Nothing beats lava for kids. Lava gets hands clean the first time. Back, boy, those guys at Napa Auto Parts. Am I right? <laughs> Damn straight. <laughs> hey, Tony, this was your choice, and I'm going to let you go first. But I had a question. I'm not super familiar with this genre, the black exploitation genre, and my director is a white guy. And I was just wondering, is that the the common thing from movies in the 70s, the black exploitation films? I, I, I would say the majority of them, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's symptomatic of the times. Uh, on the upside, uh, the directors, most of the directors that did do these films were pretty enlightened guys. 
and so, I mean, for what it's worth, um, a lot of them did, you know, a Jack Hill comes to mind. He did a lot of black exploitation movies. He worked with Pam Greer a ton. Huh. Um, and uh, Arthur Marks is another guy who, uh, and these, these guys were like just very savvy, uh, very enlightened guys. They were the right people to do these. If you could not find a person of color to direct these movies, at least... Those those are a couple of examples of, of guys who kind of had a pretty good handle on the genre, I think. Uh, so that's cool because my movie is um, uh, so what I thought black exploitation was right. was the kind of black exploitation movies that I love, you know, coffee and stuff like that that are kind of over the top. Yeah. And the movie yeah. I chose I, halfway through it, I was like, this is a really good movie and. <laughs> There's none of the tropes that I think of in black exploitation. Yeah. So I was like, do I even am I allowed Does to this use this film? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, with with all that in mind, you chose this, so you get to go first. Oh, okay. Well back to back first. Once uh, is Vanessa. Uh, oh my god. And gosh. now it's yourself. Yay. <laughs> but who would remember that a week ago? There we go. Our listeners will. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I got to admit, I, I came up with this topic just because I am a huge fan of the subgenre and all of its permutations. And we were kind of talking about narrowing it, uh, of course, down to just horror related black exploitation films. But uh, that is a narrow field at best. Uh, and so broadening it out was uh, absolutely ideal. And that's really what predicated my choice of the movie that I wanted to talk about, uh, which is basically the movie that that sort of started, kind of jump-started the cycle, which is Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song. You keep the faith in me, and you my man. You my favorite man. Can you take it, baby? I don't know where to sleep back here. Come on, boy, talk! Yes, the good thing, fairy godmother. Every dollar we make. The Guinness get 20, the police get 40, and gold bears get 50. Anybody can tell you that don't add up to a dollar. That adds up to a dollar and a dime. You offer pretty good news to me slapping up on some white cops. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> I've seen this one as well. This yeah. is uh, quite it's, a film. It is. It is a sawed-off shotgun of a movie. Uh, <laughs> nice. it, it really is. Uh, it is a crudely shot, willfully ragged, passionate, angry, and purposeful middle finger thrust in the direction of the man. And it is equal parts exploitive as hell and one of the most politically galvanizing movies that, that ever emerged uh, from a cinema. It's also crucially important as an independent statement, oh, as a statement of yeah. independent cinema. This guy, uh, Melvin Van Peebles, the writer, director, producer, and star of Sweet Sweet Beck's Badass Song, completely self-financed the movie, um, uh, made it for about a half a million dollars, and it wound up grossing uh, some $15 million in release. Oh, so wow. that's a huge-ass nice. return on an investment. It was the first movie. It, it, it came out technically after Across 110th Street, which is another terrific kind of urban action movie that flirted with the black exploitation genre. It's sort of pre-proto black exploitation. Um, but Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song is the movie that burst open the doors in terms of the fact that, my gosh, movies about african-americans movies about the black experience even if they were over the top or exploitive as they kind of became made money and uh, this movie is every bit as important in its own way uh to kind of ushering in the anything goes uh experimentation of the 70s as, as easy rider it's like that pivotal in the cinema pantheon and it's 
it dates hideously in places. It is grossly politically incorrect in places, ironically enough. But it is also, um, again, an undeniably clear snapshot of the black experience at that time. And it's just it's something else to see. I've seen it multiple times. There's an excellent Vinegar Syndrome Blu-ray about it. Oh. Uh, and it's got uh, interviews. It's got a very thoughtful commentary from a gentleman named, I think it's Omar Mims. He's a, a, a film historian. So basically, uh, what we're talking about is a chase film. Sweetback, the, the movie starts with in, in sort of flashback form uh, with Sweetback at the age of probably 11 years old. Uh, played, ironically enough, and interestingly enough, by um, Melvin Van Peebles' son, Mario, who became an actor and a director in his own right. Mm -hmm. Uh, So basically, Sweetback is an orphan, and he's given shelter uh, by the proprietor of an L.A. brothel in the 40s. While he's working there as a towel boy, he is taken sexual advantage of by uh, one of the uh, prostitutes there who nicknames him Sweetback in honor of his sexual prowess and his equipment. Um, and as uh, as an adult, he ends up becoming a sex worker, and he let, works let live sex shows. Let me jump in before you, you yes. kind of skim right over that one. Sorry. I didn't know. When I first saw this, I, I just knew what it was, the way uh-huh. you described it. I had no idea what the story was, and it came to that scene. Holy shit. That is yeah. a powerfully uncomfortable scene. And it is. Graphic. Yes. For what's going on. You know, just I, I didn't. I forewarned. Didn't mean, I didn't mean to. Yeah, and this this movie is chock full of triggers. Um, I have not seen this movie. It's. Uh, oh, it no. is something else. I actually saw it at a big screen showing at the Grand Illusion many years ago, and uh, I have the Blu-ray. You may have to look into that. Um, so anyway, um, Sweetback is uh, basically sold out by his his boss, a guy named Beetle, uh, because uh, a black man's been murdered and uh, the police are under pressure to uh, buy from the black community to bring in a suspect. So the cops hit up Beetle and say, you know, we just want to make a show of this. Uh, we're just going to arrest Sweetback. We'll handcuff him, take him in overnight, and we'll be back out. We'll have him back out again, whatever, you know, because, of course, he's he's good for business, so he doesn't want to lose Sweetback. In the attempt to uh, to uh, capture Sweetback and handcuff him, Sweetback decides, fuck this, you're not taking me in, and he beats the shit out of the two cops uh, and in the process helps liberate a Black Panther who's also you know, on the way to being incarcerated. And then from there, um, the corrupt white cops are after Sweetback and it's a chase film from there. It is definitely, uh, it definitely shows Van Peebles background in European cinema because, uh, this guy, you could do a whole podcast about this guy's life. He is like that interesting. And 10 years ago, I actually had a chance to interview him. Um, and, uh, yeah, he was absolutely so many staggering stories. This guy, um, was in the service. I I think he was in the air force. Um, when he retired, he became a San Francisco, uh, cable car driver, wrote a book about that experience ended up uh, moving to France and making several short films uh, as well as a feature film that got some acclaim. Uh, came back. Um, Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song was the ultimate commercial gamble for this guy. Mm-hmm. He was coming, he was in the middle of a very lucrative three-picture deal with Columbia Pictures. He had directed a comedy called The Watermelon Man, which is about uh, 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 the characters play. The Watermelon Man is played by a uh, black character actor, Godfrey Cambridge, who wakes up. He, he's a white man and he wakes up black one day. So it's a it's a it's a it's a very blunt edged satire, but it's a, it's a really interesting movie. Um, and it was a hit when Van Peebles cobbled together the idea for Sweet Sweet Back's Badass song. He knew goddamn well no studio would fund it. <laughs> and so he, by hook and crook, uh, scraped up the money and actually, ironically enough, got a cash infusion um, of the last $50,000 to finish the movie from Bill Cosby, uh, who just <laughs> said, here's the money, pay me back when you're done. I don't need credit or anything like that. Just, you know, I want you to make this movie. Once the movie was completed... Van Peebles ended up, he couldn't get any interest from distributors proper, and he ended up four-walling the movie in, like, two theaters, one in Atlanta and one in Chicago. And 
they were packed. There were lines around the block. Uh, Huey Newton of the Black Panthers wrote an essay, uh, a contemporaneous essay about the movie that praised it as the most revolutionary uh, film about the black experience ever made. And there's something to that. It's just uh, along the way, you see a lot of kind of experimentation in terms of how it's shot. Uh, a lot of very urgent handheld camera. It oscillates between 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter, but it gives the movie kind of this ragged energy that just keeps on moving. Uh, it's got a great soundtrack that was uh, orchestrated and played by Earth, Wind & Fire. It was written by Melvin Van Peebles because he literally, he did everything on this movie. Um, and he didn't even know how to compose. He actually, he, he had a, a, a piano keyboard and he numbered the keys on the piano. And he was talking to me about these. He's like, I didn't know any music, but I could fucking count. Wow. Um, and he, that's how he composed it. So he played, he played out the melodies on a piano that was, had numbered keys. And the Earth, Wind & Fire guys, like, basically built the soundtrack around his composition that's amazing this is so it's and it's and it really is it's it's very interesting because it also kind of takes a spaghetti western tack towards the end because a lot of it is desert pursuit um and uh, a lot of the shots a lot of the sun bleached shots of him running through the desert are very sergio leone yeah it's just it it is Again, very politically incorrect. In addition to that really uncomfortable scene with Mario at the beginning, I, you know, every woman in the movie is either a prostitute or is in love with sweet, sweet backs, badass. Um, uh, now, that said, there's sort of a Homeric quality to the movie because all of the people who help sweet back escape are all members of disenfranchised minorities. And there's actually a fairly positive portrayal of gay people in here. Um, there are, you know, he, he's aligning himself. He, he draws allies in the form of gay people and bikers and hippies and homeless people uh, who all kind of, you know, help in their little way to help him escape. And the movie was absolutely rev revolutionary. It changed Hollywood. It changed the outlook on independent cinema. It changed uh, the presence of black faces in cinema. You know, um, up until that point, really, unless you were Sidney Poitier and super acceptable to the masses, black men never prevailed. They were never sexual beings. They were asexual, you know, servants. And here came this guy who just like burst that door open on it. And uh, yeah, it's imperfect, but it is absolutely riveting to watch it's really it's kind of one of those must see pillars of 70s cinema to just really get a good handle on where the industry went from there speaking of riveting to watch i'm really pissed that i let you go first yeah, no i shit. don't know how we're gonna follow uh -huh. the the Sorry. passion you have for this i i'm like why aren't i watching this movie right, right. now yeah. i'm i'm gonna Turn this off. I'm gonna go watch a movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah no it's I, yeah, and and it's also there's also a very good um, biopic about the making of the movie, directed by and starring Mario Van Peebles. So that's what, that's what is that? Good what is that called? It's called you Badass. Remember? Badass. Uh, is this movie on Prime? Do you know? I know you have the it Blu -ray. was when I watched. I, it. Yeah, it, okay. it should be on Amazon Prime. Oh, fuck, I'm putting this on tonight. Yeah, it, it's it's, I, a, it's an experience. It, it is. is. I mean, it it is. Imp well, again. I, like I said, it's a sawed-off shotgun of a movie, but it's absolutely. I was I was riveted all over again watching it. It's it it really it, it's still a, a very powerful piece of work. Wow. Yeah, it's awesome, and it's exploitive as hell. Oh, that was another one of the oh, many geez, great is. things that one of the really super savvy things that Van Peebles did um, in the marketing of the movie is. He never submitted it for a rating because there's <laughs> full frontal nudity and it's just, it's definitely well, there's real. There's yeah. actual real. Sex. Exactly. I mean, yeah. not all the sex is simulated. In right. fact, most of it isn't, is not. And that's another great story. Van Peebles contracted gonorrhea. He alleges from one of the women that was in the yeah. movie that he had quote simulated unquote sex with. And he <laughs> claimed it as workman's compensation and got it because he was hurt on the job. <laughs> also, the movie, he Smart. one of the marketing lines uh, for the movie, and it's on the poster, actually, it never got an MPAA rating. It was, quote, rated X 
by an all white jury. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so yeah, that's like one extended middle finger to the man right there. Wow. Great okay. stuff. All right. Thank you for joining us for Strange Eons. Right. We're right. done for the day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go next just in case Eric is as passionate about his film. <laughs> I don't want to be shown up twice. And also, I, I imagine that, uh, that you know probably a bit more about the movie I watched than I do. So, Tony, if you feel like jumping in on any of this, please do. Will do. What I chose, so it's funny because I said, let's open it up to other genre, or not, uh, not genre, but other films and not just right. try and stick to uh, supernatural or genre black exploitation. I, of course, ended up choosing one that does fall into that range. But at first, I, I thought to myself, one of my very favorite black exploitation films is Three the Hard Way. Damn right. With, yeah. with yes. Jim Kelly and Fred Williamson. Yeah. And, and I thought, I think that's kind of popular, so I didn't want to choose that. I think the movie I did end up choosing is also that popular. But after that, then, I found myself going down a bit of a rabbit hole, and I started uh, watching the Black Dragon movies. Do you know these? Oh, my God, yes. Well, The Jim Kelly movies, right? But oh. I thought it was Jim Kelly, and now I did not write down the actor. It is not Jim Kelly. And then it turned out that those are really just... Uh, kung fu movies they're they're yeah. not black exploitation at all in fact they're done not by the shaw brothers but by uh by one of the smaller uh chinese companies yeah and those movies are an absolute blast to watch but the only black character is by that that main black actor whose yeah. name i did not write down uh what i ended up choosing is a movie called jd's revenge something awful is gonna happen there's big trouble coming it's J.D.'s Revenge. Your gene cleanses your soul out. Listen, man, ain't nothing wrong with my soul. There was a real mean killing, and the wrong guy died. They buried his body, but his soul survived for J.D.'s Revenge. Lately, I've been getting these headaches, you know? I've never felt this lost before in my life. You beat me up. Ike, you, uh... I don't remember doing any of those things. The reincarnation of a killer who came back from the dead to possess a man's soul, make love to his woman, and get the vengeance he craved. I mean, I'm cracking up, man. I blacked out. Glenn Terman, the star of Cooley High. What in the world have you done to yourself? I ain't seen a get up like that in 25 years. <laughs> yeah. Joan Pringle. Well, my business is where Theodos. Lou Gossett. There is no danger, Theodos. He wasn't himself. Don't nobody talk to me like that. He turned into this, into this monster, a whole other person. Scared of your dad. There is something wrong with Ike. Tonight he kept saying he was this J.D. Walker. J.D. Walker's been dead for over 30 years. It's J.D. Walker. It's J.D.'s voice. Hey, that good for nothing, brother, y'all. And his manner? I got skull to settle with him. You were possessed. You know this kill, Betty Joe. Oh. <laughs> Forty years later, on someone else's face, you can see J.D. Walker's hatred. Time just won't erase. J.D.'s revenge. I'll have my revenge. From 1976. It's an entertaining movie. It's a, it's it's enjoyable. Eric, you have not seen I this? Not seen this one. Okay. I could find no budget or box office information. Rotten Tomatoes doesn't have a critic score, but the audience has it at 60% which at first I was a little bummed by, and and now I'm uh, encouraged by, because I think that maybe a lot of people haven't really given this film a chance. It stars, well, it's directed by Arthur Marks, who I was telling you earlier, is a, yep. is a white guy who is responsible for a couple of uh, really big black exploitation films, like Detroit 9000, yeah. Bucktown, Friday Foster, Friday Foster, which I enjoy quite a bit. Oh, it's entertaining as fuck. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> Uh, it was written by Jason Starks, who only has four credits. Uh, one of them was The Fish That Saved Pittsburgh. And then, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> the other three are just television episodes, so I'm not sure what happened with him. Uh, the latest television episode was a MacGyver episode. So he did uh, Scarecrow and Mrs. King and MacGyver and I, maybe two episodes of MacGyver. So I'm not sure. Hey, it's a living. Yeah, but not for him. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> It stars Glenn Turman, who uh, yes. is a phenomenal actor. 154 credits. Uh, most recently, I, I loved seeing this. Still a working actor. He was in the Fargo TV series, which I think is spectacular. Yes. He, he was in Mr. Mercedes just recently. Huh? He was in the film uh, Super 8. 
He was in John Dies at the End. Uh, yes, I oh, love him in John Dies at the End. He, he just shows he, up for a small part, and you're like, oh, yeah, fantastic. Well, the whole the, the whole deadpan scene where he's like pouring gas in the room. Yes. Uh, I yeah. suppose you're wondering why I'm pouring the gas in the room. <laughs> oh, just beautiful. Yeah, he's a great actor, and he's terrific in this movie, too. He, he really is. And it also stars uh, Louis Gossett Jr. as Lou Gossett. Uh, you know, you know who we know from Officer and Gentleman, Enemy Man, Enemy Mine, uh, a guilty pleasure of mine, Jaws 3D, Roots, and just recently it was in the Watchmen TV series, and he was fucking spectacular. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen it yet. You it's, haven't watched the Watchmen? Oh, I know. TV series? I am lameness. You're going to love it. It is okay. so good. Yeah. yeah. It also stars Joan Pringle, David McKnight, and uh, it starts off. It's a it's a young black student who is out with his girlfriend and another couple. They're double dating there in New Orleans, and they're kind of wandering around. This is uh, so. As much as I love movies that are set in the seventies, I really love movies that are actually shot in the seventies. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. There's a big difference. Yeah. There really is. Yeah, and the, just everything in this is so 1975, 76. It's Absolutely. in New Orleans, and they're out for a night on the town, and it shows them just kind of being out at bars and, and having a good time. Everybody's wearing their bell bottoms. Uh, everybody's got sideburns. It's just like my favorite year ever. <laughs> and they end up at a live hypnotism show, which is just an odd thing to think about, but then you realize that was a big thing <laughs> oh, in that the was 70s. A, that was a total <laughs> 70s thing, man. And uh, there's this this gal who's doing a live hypnotism show, and she's bringing audience members up, and she brings them up there, and, and she hypnotizes them. They fall asleep, and then she's like, let's have fun with these guys. <laughs> and, you know, she's got them raising their arms and telling them it's too cold in here, and they're freezing. Oh, no, now you're in the middle of the desert. They're stripping their clothes off, and it's... It's a uh, it's a silly scene, but it's 100 percent believable. Yeah. You're watching these people react in a way that you would absolutely react because it keeps cutting back to the people at his table who are just cracking up. And oh, yeah. uh, it's, it's just one of those things. If you've been to Vegas in the early 80s, you know, I went to Reno when I was too young and got to see some <laughs> uh, live hypnotism show. And it was it was just like this. But what happens in this hypnotism episode is it somehow opens him up to be possessed by the the spirit of a gangster who was killed in the 40s in New Orleans and who is looking for revenge. The, the actual film opens up with this scene of this guy finding his sister dead and then him being shot by somebody. And so for the rest of the film, Glenn Turman is now playing this increasingly more important dual role as he he at first starts uh acting a little bit like the gangster jd who uh who was you know a bit of a badass carried around a uh razor what do you call those razors that uh straight razor a straight razor yeah. thank you and uh not a very nice guy to the women and this comes out in uh in in glenn's relationship with his girlfriend and the thing is, they really play upon the fact that this is a, a young black law student. He is following the rules, and wow. he is a very almost meek kind of guy. He's, mm. he's a yeah. really nice kid who's well on his way to becoming a, a successful lawyer. And, uh, and his girlfriend is also this way. In fact, the other black couple that they're with, everybody here is, is a successful black people. Super positive portrayal of black people in this film. And this was one of the things as I'm watching this going, this has none of the stuff that I generally associate with black exploitation. There's every black character in this is a cop or is a uh, preacher or is a law student, <laughs> a nurse, you know, and it's one of those things It's like, boy, this is really positive uh, depicta depictations. Depiction? We've been depictions. depictions. Thank you. Yes. I've been we've all been drinking a little depictions. bit today. <laughs> <laughs> depictions of black people. And and I ended up realizing, boy, I don't even know if this is black exploitation who's being exploited here? <laughs> see the uh, black exploitation is honestly just a catch all turn for black centered cinema of the 70s i yeah. mean really and you know the black exploitation label is just a quick convenient label for a vast variety of films of every fucking strata of quality and budget that just happen to center on black people okay well so this, that's it this technically yeah. falls into that then 
Yeah. But this is a really tight, tense thriller. Oh, it is. It's really good. I, I, in fact, as I'm watching it, I was thinking, why hasn't this been remade? <laughs> this is a really good movie that would really benefit from a big cast and a nice budget. It's just fantastic. It reminds me a lot in places of a Richard Matheson story. Interesting. Oh, wow. I never thought about that, but yeah. Yeah, definitely. yeah. It's got kind of a stir of echoes feel to it. Oh, damn. Yeah, it's 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 good. It's it's it, that's a really good choice because I think, despite the fact that it is known, I do think it's one of the less hailed and less cultishly yeah. adored um, movies in the whole kind of black exploitation. Maybe because it's not over the top and it doesn't. I, yeah, I, I was it's pleased not Dolomite to see, kind of thing. Yes, at one point I was like, well, maybe this makes this film. A, allowed for me to choose because at one point somebody does scream jive turkey and i was like okay okay we're kind of here that's it checklist <laughs> 70s comment yes. uh, the funny thing is you know we were all alive in the 70s jive turkey was like my favorite thing to call anybody in 1976 <laughs> Mom. it was the it was the cool insult it indeed really it was so lou gossett is uh, reverend eliza Elijah Bliss, who JD is coming for, and man, he is solid. He is young and handsome and f charismatic as yes. hell. Yeah. Oh my God, he's so good in this. I think that the film is shot with a ton of flair. I uh, there's a there's a real uh, a real love for this story going on. So I'm guessing that Arthur Marks. I mean, I I have not seen Detroit Nine Thousand or Bucktown, but I like Friday Foster, which is. Over the top, yeah, and those and Buck Bucktown and uh, Detro Detroit Nine Thousand, Detroit Nine Thousand less so, but both of those are pretty over the top too. Okay, this one does not feel that way at all. Yeah, I'm it doesn't. It's sure. very uncharacteristic. He is so different when he is the law student versus when he is JD, JD. Walker. Yeah, uh, and the best, my favorite scene is when he's gone full JD and he walks into a club and he is sporting this gigantic hat and this three piece suit with vest and it uh, is badass. He's got his hair <laughs> slicked back and everything. He doesn't even look like the same person, and I feel like. He, I'm not sure if everybody, while they were making this, knew that this was going to be a, a little bit more than just a black exploitation film, but everybody certainly acts like it yeah. is. There's not, there's none of the, the winking of we're making kind of a silly movie oh, in right. this, uh, and it's it's got some pretty, it's got a a, a couple of attempted rape scenes in it, uh, it's got some really serious things going on where you know his girlfriend uh, he she becomes the victim of of him as jd and there's some uncomfortable stuff and part of the uncomfortableness is that she's willing to take him back after this and you're you're kind of like Ooh. boy this is a this is a hard thing to deal with but it's not a it's not a unbelievable thing to deal with I think I think there's a really neat mystery to the story because the reveal at the end is that what we saw at the beginning is not exactly what happened. And so there's some of that going on. And I got to say, Tony, when when this came up as your pick, I was like, this is not my favorite genre of film. And I only have mm -hmm. a couple that I like. And most of them, I think, are, are problematic, to say the least. Uh, it brought me to this film, which I'd never seen before. I fucking loved it, and now I'm I'm dying I'm to so happy. I'm dying to see the uh, the film that you chose, and and I can't wait to hear what Eric's got. Well, we have got quite the trio of styles of films going <laughs> here. I got to tell you, man, uh, because I went, boy, I'd say almost f art house with a film from 1973 called Ganja and Hess. <laughs> The only perversions that can be comfortably condemned are the perversions of others. I will persist and survive without God's or society's sanction. I will not be tortured. I will not be punished. I will not be guilty. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for thee, preserve thy body and soul for everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for thee. And be thankful.
He's not a criminal. He's a victim. Amazon Prime, easily available, easy to see. This one has an interesting Rotten Tomatoes score, which is 86 from critics, 51 from the audience. Mm. A lot of heights. Yes. I, I have seen this one, and this is a good movie. Yeah. I don't know what that 51% is all about. The, it, it's got an interesting release period, too. It was budgeted three, 350000 box office of 21000 but that was worded weird. It almost looks like the box office that was listed was for its re-release in the early 2000s. It had a re-release. Yeah, then, this was kind of a big movie, I thought. I could, I could, it sort of. It was released and on, on the original cut was released, and it, did, it actually did not do very well on its initial release. But the th- studio took it back, edited in 15 minutes or so of new footage, but made the movie 33 minutes shorter. And so they did all this in its first release? This was between 73 was its first release, 75 was when they did this. Oh, interesting. Um, released as um, Blood Couple in 75, or, and then as Double Possession again in 2018. <laughs> so this is a weird history to this film. I wonder if that was an original title. Why would you change the title? I'm not sure. I could Because kinda... it's not marketable enough. Uh, yeah, okay. Ganjan Hess is pretty... It's pretty oblique. Is that about marijuana? What is... Good point, good point. (laughs) Blood Couple works better than Double Possession, though. Yeah, Double Uh, Possession sounds like a bad 90s, like, Demi Moore thriller or something. Seeing the film, Ganjan Hess is perfectly fine as the name. But it was directed and written by Bill Gunn, who didn't do a lot of stuff. Uh, Personal Problems and Stop, with an exclamation point, (laughs) were other films he directed. He's also, he's more of an actor. He did yeah. like Route 66 and The Fugitive and Man from Uncle, a lot of TV work. And he is one of the main, it's basically three people in this film. He's one of those three. Uh, stars Dwayne Jones, best known as Night, Night of the Living, Living Dead. Dead's ben. Who had a su- depressingly small career as an actor. He did go on to do some interesting stuff, which I hadn't realized. I was like, but he went on and formed a, a theater black group. theater group yeah. and uh, did that for a long time, like uh, many, many years. So he he did continue to work in acting. He just didn't really do any more films or TV or anything. And he is phenomenal in this. He is. Holy shit. Uh, Marlene Clark, who was uh, uh, Enter the Dragon. Uh, she's a script coordinator for General Hospital. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> That's interesting. Isn't she in The Beast Must Die? believe so. I don't know if I saw that. Maybe I got her for I Night th- of the Cobra Women, Woman. Yeah. Beware the Blob and Black Mamba were the ones I referenced, but she uh-huh. did a lot more work. She did a fair amount. Yeah, she's that, uh, she's like exotically beautiful and yeah. quite the presence on screen. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was one other guy I listed who's more of a bit part, but because he's interesting, Tommy Lane, who is a live and let die in Shaft, so he had some cool movie credit. The idea is, okay, this is an art film, so it's kind of hard to describe. The film, the story, the plot is very simple. Uh, the basic idea is there's a supernatural knife that stabs BJ's character, or Bill Gunn, excuse me, Bill Gunn's character, uh, long before the movie starts, and he is basically a vampire. These vampires are a little closer to the hunger. I wonder if the hunger borrowed a little bit from this. because they. I would not a, be surprised. Because he uses a tiny little knife. To get the blood out of people, which is kind of reminiscent of what The Hunger did. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Dwayne is playing his chauffeur and kind of assistant overall in his kind of life. Not in a um, couple way, but kind of his life companion, at least the beginning of the film. Uh, Melina Clark does not come into the movie until a good chunk of the way in. Yeah. Almost, maybe not quite halfway into the film. But the it starts off with an interesting title cards and voiceover to explain all of this. So you kind of know what's going on because the movie is not a let's explain what's happening kind of film. Oh, totally. I had to tell you, the beginning of this, it's definitely low budget, which shows a lot in the sound. Holy shit, the sound is rough in this movie. But it's still really neat and a really smooth style. The way the characters are set up and the way they communicate, the way they talk, which I think is kind of a 
a mainstay in a lot of low budget seventies films and black exploitation films where the acting is very naturalistic. It's very yeah. easy and comfortable and they seem very, Bill seems like that's how he is on all the time <laughs> when he's doing some of his stuff. See the film, the way it starts out, it almost casts a strange, it almost casts, casts a strange spell on you. And the f- opening music is amazing. The whole score is incredible. Yeah. Although it gets a little repetitive with that one <laughs> yeah. chant thing by the end of the movie. It's like, okay, come on. But they play with that well. Yeah. <laughs> so it still works. And Bill, Con- Bill Gunn starts the movie with these strange, long monologues and the music and the stuff. By the end of the movie, I was iffy with the film, but for the first 20, 30 films, I was absolutely, totally engrossed by this film. Mm-hmm. I love it. Bill Gunn on screen. Yeah. His presence and his weird delivery and the way he tells his stories is just deeply engrossing. The his interactions with other people that come and go quickly is also really interesting. He's just neat. I, I he's not in the film very long. I wish he'd been in it longer. Yeah. There's kind of the only thing I could think to describe of his some of his conversations at the beginning is if you've ever seen my dinner with Andre. Where it's basically two oh my guys God. deeply yes. philosophically yes. speaking. <laughs> Gee, who, who'd have thunk it? Maybe uh, <laughs> was that Louis Maul who directed that? Uh, yeah, uh, was Louis Maul riffing on black exploitation? <laughs> That's what I want to know. So he's giving these amazing, interesting takes on the world. Although I have to say, he did one of the gro- one of the grosser things I think I've ever seen in film, where he's taking a bath and uses the bathwater to brush his teeth. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh yeah, my. <laughs> <laughs> what did you just do? <laughs> oh. The acting is high, is absolutely quality yeah. in this film. All three of the leads are, are very good and easy to watch. And the the big turn on the film is when, totally catch the motivation for why this, but Gunn's character decides, I guess he's done. So he passes on the knife <laughs> by killing the chauffeur, not really telling him anything, just stabs him and lets him change into whatever vampire whatever you want to call him yeah and then he shoots himself in the heart like okay i guess he's out of this film and that's not too long into it i like i said i wish gun had been in the film longer from there the rest of this movie is hess the character Hess, played by uh, Dwayne, trying to figure out what's going on for a little while and then figuring out what's going on and living his life this is not a three-act structure film. This is Definitely not a It's a heroes. 70s movie. Yes. It, it is very much a 70s yeah, movie. There's no hero's journey really going on here. Yeah. But, but it's not a slice of life. It's not like Dazed and Confused, where it's like, hey, here's these people. Let's follow them around. It's its its, its own unique entity in a lot of ways. Folks try to rob them. Doesn't go well for them. You know, things like that happen. And Ganja shows up part of the way through the film and is immediately taking over the movie. She is a instant thunderclap to his world and yeah. just really changes everything for him. She's not really nice. No, she's <laughs> not. <laughs> the early part of the film. That's one way to put it. <laughs> she's kind of mean to people that work in the house. And uh, so I was like, geez, man, uh, which is interesting. It's a nice juxtaposition from what Gunn had been doing earlier and what Hess was doing for the rest of the film. Yeah. She's, <laughs> she's not sure what's going on until she decides... She finds Bill Gunn's character frozen in a refrigerator in the basement. <laughs> like, ah. Oops. It's hard to call anything spoilery for this film because it's not. It's so freeform. Yeah. yeah it, it's not, oh, you won't believe what happens A, B, and C. Right. As it is, you realize at some point he's probably going to be stabbing her and bringing her along, which he kind of does. And it, the way it goes is not smooth. Um, it's a very sexual film without being feeling exploitative at all. Yeah. It does it in a very uh, smooth manner. Smooth just fits this film a lot. There's a lot of smooth directing. There's yeah. a lot of smooth acting. There's wild scenes at the beginning with um, Bill and him going to like a museum. And there's a, a white guy in a yeah. mask escorting him. And it's like, so feel free to jump in. You know, oh, I, I have a six degrees of separation bit of trivia about that movie. Um, oh, yeah. You know the surrealistic dream sequence where the, the that very large African-American woman is running around almost nude? Yeah. That woman is Shirley Hemphill, who played Raj's mom on the What's Happening TV series. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so Raj's mom from What's Happening is running around nearly naked uh, in a surrealistic dream se- sequence in a, in a black 
centric horror film. I yeah, I really like this movie a lot. And I you you hit the nail on the head when you say it weaves a spell because it does it is one of those movies it, it's a classic slow burn movie and it's interesting um kelly you were talking earlier about jd's revenge being this i think this is another movie that might benefit from a quality remake i think that yeah. i think that I, well, I could see it a24 it has been. type oh spike lee oh that's right yeah. that's right i haven't seen that yet i haven't either but the description of it makes me less the, interested the in sweet seeing blood it. of jesus yeah because it he it sounds like, um, oh, what Gus Van Sant did with Psycho, uh, where it's, he, he says it's largely a shot by shot remake. remake. I'm like, Come on, man. You're talented, more talented yeah, than that. Do exactly. Something. Yeah. I, I, I'm curious. I never had a chance to see it. But I mean, I, I yeah, I could see somebody doing it, assuming the Spike Lee movie did not hit the nail on the head, which apparently it didn't. I could see somebody making it. This feels like a 70s version of an A24 picture to me. Oh, yeah. That's it, really, it really does. Yes. I mean, it really, it really does. does. And that and that and that's with all the blessings and perceived curses of that, that that implies, because it's not a movie for everybody, for sure. No. I mean, I can, I can see why it did not do well on its initial release, because it's just, you can't pigeonhole it. And the title, it starts with the title. You cannot pigeonhole Ganja and Hess as, you know, as black exploitation movie it's it's not a standard issue horror movie i mean it definitely is horrific but it's definitely not assembly line in any way shape or form yeah. and which i think is what's interesting about it. like i said i was up and down watching this movie there are yeah. times i thought absolutely engrossed and loving and other times going man i don't like this at all but i think that's great i think that's what an art film quote unquote should do yeah i have a weird time thinking if you're watching a sh true heavy art film like the most recent one i can think of is uh lighthouse yeah where if you sit through the lighthouse and it doesn't at some point make you feel different and weird, it's probably not working right. Yeah, exactly. And this one definitely <laughs> goes up and down. It's like, what the heck? Do you think the 51% uh, audience rating is because of the uh, the lack of traditional structure? Probably. Yeah, I, I would point to that. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. That's probably the key. Because uh, uh, And it's also, like I said, excruciatingly low budget. Even at 350000 it wasn't, to be honest, I don't know if it was the best spent 350,000, which yeah. isn't a lot when you're talking about buying 35 millimeter and doing all the stuff you had to do in the seventies. That's 70s. just it. 350,000 now goes a lot further ironically yeah. than it did in the seventies. Exactly. It's true. And I don't know if it's kind of like, I can't tell if this is a fully remastered or if this is as good as it can look, but it still works. Yeah. It's not a full remastered. It still looks good. There's just something interesting about the film. It's one I'd actually wanted to see for years. And when this came up, so that's why I knew immediately I'm going, I've got to see this one and I'm going to check it out. And I was, I was glad it's so easily available. Yeah. I saw this in a theater setting. Oh, wow. Uh, 15 or 20 years ago. Wow. And I can't remember what was what was the deal with it, if it was some kind of black exploitation thing. And I just ended up getting on this one because it had, you know, quote unquote vampires in it or something like that. And I remember being not disappointed, but I walked away going, that was not at all what I expected and I still enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I can see that. Definitely. That's, yeah, that's that parallels it, my reaction to I a mean, great extent. Critically re release actually was very well credit critically it was well well received. It was uh, screamed in cons in nineteen seventy three. The Cons Film Festival named it one of the ten best American films of the decade. Wow. Uh, so I mean it, it well, and it is works. very European. That's mm -hmm. it, it feels very European art house. Yes, so yeah. yeah, it's no wonder that that it found an audience at Con because it definitely it, it it is it's it's art house horror. So I would say that if you're interested in dumping into the black exploitation and all it might offer, I think we three got three at this point we got one more movie to go. Right. We'll see what that fits. But at this point we've got three really good I would say start with Tony's if you're really interested and then go from there. Because it's it's just it's, it's black exploitation one oh one is what yeah. it is you know it's it's ground zero for it so yeah but it, so if you're interested I but these are you lot. guys great picks so yeah. far I'm looking forward to what Vanessa has to roll out and Amazon Prime is a gold mine oh yeah. totally yeah. totally I don't know who distribute what distributors they picked up but they've got they've got the uh, the hookup for these kind of films yeah really you can good. easily go down the rabbit hole easily yeah. Well, let's take a moment to find out what Vanessa did. We are going to Skype with her while she is off uh, on the other side of the country. And we will be right back with Tony.
Hey, we have got on the phone again, Vanessa Williams. Vanessa, we miss you so much. When are you coming back? We don't like Tony. <laughs> soon. Very soon. Very soon. I swear, this is this is the last time for a little bit. So um, I apologize. I've, I've abandoned you guys for so, so long. And I know the weeks are just that much harder. And all you have to look forward to is a guy in a swanky outfit with some good film know-how but actually just talking to you for a few minutes is making me rethink maybe having tony as our regular guest <laughs> <laughs> we we love you tony we do we do <laughs> I but have you're to, not a chick. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I have to bring up the fact that uh, I opened the mailbox the other day, and in the mail was a package from Amazon Prime oh. addressed to Casey Young. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I, I looked at this and I thought, okay, who is this? It's got to be my niece. <laughs> and then I, I opened it and I looked at what was in, inside and I said, Hmm. Perhaps this is Danny Williford. This seems like one of the things he might do. And uh-huh. then I recalled that uh, that a month and a half ago or so, you sent me a little text that said, what's your mailing address? And I just <laughs> blindly gave it out because I thought maybe I'd get a lovely Christmas card or something. No, what I got in the mail, Eric, was better than a Christmas oh, card. Yes. It was a Blu-ray of Day of the Dolphin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, she mentioned. She told me she was going to send that to you. Yeah. So you knew all about this oh, yes. already. Okay. Yeah. I, oh yeah, I texted Eric first. I wanted to see if he had your address before I asked you. <laughs> so, so I took a picture of it and I, I sent it to Vanessa, and nice. uh, and I said, "I'm on to you." <laughs> <laughs> well, the hardest like, part was I, when I was addressing it to you because it was like a pre-order and I was really nervous. I've had gifts get lost in the mail before. I put down Casey quote Kelly quote young. So just in case it would still find its way to you, hopefully. (laughs) It found its way into my mailbox, which I'm not even sure how Amazon does that because I've got a locked mailbox. So it must have ended up at the actual post office at some point. They can do anything now. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, and I, I, first of all, Thank you so much. I do oh God, not have this movie. It's got a Yay! commentary. Oh, wow. So I'm like, I can't wait to fucking watch this again. But I think, Vanessa, the unfortunate part for you is I might make you watch this movie with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's not unfortunate at all, especially if I get your impressions during the film. That's oh. what matters. <laughs> I know. I'm, I, at first I was like, I'm going to make her ugly cry in front of me. And then I realized, oh, she's going to see me ugly cry. <laughs> The world is a vicious cycle. Oh, I'm just so glad you didn't already have it. I was very nervous. And I know that this is like a new like rip or whatever. I think it's like a, you know, Blu-ray high quality edition of it. Yeah. Yeah. I was looking at this going, wow, this is I mean, I know this was a joke. This is a really thoughtful gift. Thank you very much. Of course. Yeah. (laughs) Anytime. Anytime there is a weird, rare thing we've talked about that I am pretty sure you might not have, then there we go. (laughs) Now I'm just going to um, figure out all the things I want and kind of mention it offhand to you. (laughs) Can you do one of those like weird, creepy things that like hot girls on the Internet do where you have your own Amazon wish list that's public and people... (laughs) People from our show could, like, pick stuff and send it to you. You're going to love this. So I thought that maybe this was something uh, Danny Williford would do because he's sent me books and stuff in the past. And he's, you know, he's become a, quite a friend. He's a great listener, but a good friend. And I sent him a picture of the label that said Casey Young. And I said, did you do this? And he said, no, I'm trying not to get a restraining order from you. <laughs> <laughs> Good man, good man, thoughtful. I'm. I don't. I don't have those hangups at all. Clearly, I'm like, you're, you're not worried it. about that at all. <laughs> Maybe that's actually why we're doing this Skype call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you couldn't be within 500 feet. That's right. Yep. Uh, speaking of <laughs> uncomfortable Popo things, uh, this topic was Tony's, and it was black exploitation, and yeah. you have a choice. <laughs> I have a choice. Well, I mean, you made a choice. <laughs> I'm okay. Yeah, the that's film a you more picked, important. The film response. you picked is a choice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Black Devil Doll from Hell. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Interesting pick. You know, 
it was high up on many lists and I thought, oh, this sounds great. It's a horror kind of style film. It's black exploitation. It's, it's going to hit a bunch of boxes for me. It's based off the exorcist. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> you guys have seen this, right? Oh yes. Yeah. Well, oh. I've n- I have not finished it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! You you should finish it. I mean, you need to know what happens. I don't. Do I? I can't wait to hear your total review of it. Yes. Oh my God! Yes. You got like I was just. I realized partway through. I was like, this is somebody's fetish film. <laughs> like, somebody has a fetish and they desperate. This is just porn. It's just porn. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Not far off. <laughs> yeah, and not good porn either. <laughs> no, no, not good porn. In so, fact, like that's that's been what I've heard so far is that most uh, most porn is better than this. Yeah. But you guys will hear more all about it shortly. Fantastic! Can't wait. And thank you so much for doing this. And I know that uh, the fans were going to be crazy if we had to uh, have Tony keep filling in for you. That fucking yeah. guy. <laughs> No, I know, I know, but that's cool. Don't worry. After this, we'll have a nice Vanessa presence. I'll, I'll do my best to be there for you guys. I'm not abandoning ship. I'm here. I'm here. That means you will be here right. next week, right? That is correct. Fantastic. Oh, okay. Good. Oh, did do you we... want to tell her what the subject will yeah, be wait, for next week? Yeah, what's the subject? Week? Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know if I want to tell you because it's at the end of the episode. Oh, okay. I'll, well, I'll tell I guess I'll find you. out. Go ahead and I, tell her. And you know I will, what? I'm going to listen. No, don't tell me. I'm going to listen to the episode, and then okay. I'm going to find out, and then I'm going to go find my film. Roger. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Vanessa, we love you. We'll see you in a week. All right. See you Have soon, fun. guys. Have okay, bye. bye. Hi, everybody. This is week two of me not being in the exact same room as Eric and Kelly, which is very distressing, very frustrating, very sad. But I hear that Tony's been doing a great job of um, standing in for me. So I hope that you guys are still enjoying the show, even without my amazing presence. Um, I did actually watch a movie for this week, so I'd love to talk to you about it. Black exploitation was definitely a little bit of a hard one for me. I've seen a bit of it in film school, like a couple of different films. I actually saw um, Sweet, Sweet, Badass Song. Sorry, I'm butchering it right now, but um, I saw it with uh, Van Peebles' son was, I believe, giving a Q&A at the Northwest Film Forum over it and met him, and that was really cool. It was really, like, fascinating. But I I do have a hard time with like really, really low budget looking, not, it's not even low budget. It's like if somebody makes a film on their camcorder, there's just something about it that I have a harder time connecting to. I don't find it as fascinating because I feel like filmmaking, part of a big, a big part of that for me is that everyone's like putting in different kinds of crafts to make it work and it feels very solo a lot of the time. However, I will say the first movie I started watching, I thought was great. <laughs> it was so good. I was really enjoying it. I was like, oh my God, okay. Like I haven't seen a black exploitation movie of this quality and like I'm really enjoying it. And then about 30, 35 minutes in, I realized I was watching Kelly's pick and had to stop. So I do think that I need to explore this genre a lot more. I'm guessing that there's actually a ton of stuff that I just haven't come across yet that's going to be really good. Uh, I then swapped to, of course, like I found this cool horror black exploitation film. I was super excited. It's based off of The Exorcist 1984 movie, and it's called Black Devil Doll from Hell. just another ordinary Sunday for Helen Black. But when she entered the Rhodes and gift shop, something magical began to happen. (laughs) Shirley L. Jones as Helen Black. Reverend Obi Dunson as himself, and also as himself, the Black Devil doll. Oh. Oh. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh. In the end, oh. the Black 
Black Devil doll finds its way back to the gift shop, ready for another adventure. Just like you'll find yourself watching this one-of-a-kind film over and over again. Black Devil Doll from Hell is um, it's a unique piece. It's 70 minutes long, although the director's cut is actually 140 minutes, so we'll get into that in a minute. Um, the budget was $10,000. It took three and a half days to write, but it was filmed over several years. It was written, produced, and directed by Chester Novell, uh, or Novel, um, two L's, so I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. Obviously, like, he put a lot of work and time into it. The plot is very straightforward. A religious woman who is determined to wait for marriage to have sex goes to a thrift store, finds this big, freaky-looking puppet, brings it home, and it comes to life with an evil spirit, kind of drives out um, a sexual, an insatiable sexual desire in her. And uh, the movie goes from there. It's, um, it, it, um, uh, okay, let's talk about other things. Um, so it's initially um, supposed to be part of an anthology, but actually the film grew to be too big. But I believe his second film kind of was the, the original anthology, I think. But it was a uh, return to the quadrad zone, which he did in 87. This one, he clearly like filmed, I believe, mostly on VHS because the beginning and end credits both look like they're kind of VHS inserts. The music is really interesting. It's basically like the Casio sound loops. So um, <laughs> there's a lot of like do 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 like the like little like synthesized sounding basic drum beat on like repeat so the music is really like kind of messes with your head after a while it was uh filmed like i said over several years um turner in fact um began to date the lead actress shirley l jones part way into it and she was his lead she was the religious and then very not religious woman she even did his second film. I don't believe that they stayed together after that. The crazy, creepy looking doll is actually modeled after Rick James. Um, and when it's not the doll, it's played by his nephew, which is kind of upsetting. Yeah. And uh, Turner had no film experience before this. He actually took a correspondence class and that's how he got into it. Um, so the plot, when when you're watching, I mean, it's very straightforward. It's really like a woman, she goes to church with her friend and, her, and then they go off to leave church. And then, you know, she's very, it's clear she's a very prideful woman who um, is, is waiting, is waiting till marriage. And she thinks that everyone is a little bit below her, but also, also very filthy. Um, and there is like a filth, quality to this. I think just because of the low budget nature, you do get that feeling of griminess to, um, to the sin world. When she buys the puppet, she first puts it in the bathroom while she takes a shower, which is kind of weird. And then you realize it's because the toilet seat, I believe provides the actual toilet it provides a great space in which somebody can puppet this and put his, uh, hand up in it and like and make it dock so I think I'm pretty sure that's why it sat there anyways it begins to come alive and then she starts to have these really crazy dreams where she's having sex with it and then all of a sudden it did, does come to life and she's like man I can't like why am I sexually attracted to this thing like this doesn't make any sense and um then yeah it comes to life and it basically ties her up and forces her to have sex with it but by the end she's begging for more and she just uh it's like a lesson in pleasure and pain kind of thing and then um when they're finished uh basically the doll kind of falls asleep and goes into like a hibernation period 
and she can't like get it to come back alive. So then she's so desperate for that amazing sexual experience that she starts just like inviting random dudes back to her place. She like taps on her window at one point and just like grabs a dude off the street and has sex with him. But none of them are as good as the devil doll. None, none can beat him. The uh, Rick James looking dude, which is why I'm saying it's really disturbing that like when it's walking around is played by the director's nephew, who's clearly a child. It's like, oh God, like this puppet is just there to have sex with this woman. And the, the ending is kind of neat. Uh, I don't even know if I should give that away, but it's um, it's got some like kind of cool elements to it as far as like a, I want to say a twist, but it's a little like Twilight Zone-y, like kind of be careful what you wish for sort of style. So if you do watch it, I would say, you know, try to stick it out to the end because that's probably the only part that makes it worthwhile. I I hated this film. I just, I I felt worse having seen it. It's clearly somebody's fetish film. Like this it's like porn if porn was really, really, really bad. Like the, think of the worst porn you've ever seen, then go down three levels. Like clearly somebody was sitting around going, you know what, like what if a woman like fucked a doll or whatever and um, decided to make it and it's just overly sexualized. The doll is horrifying looking. Um, the, the woman, um, I'm sure she's a beautiful woman, but they do not really like make her look terribly nice in this. And you don't sympathize for her for even a second because of the way that they like make her just so prideful. Like this film was a really hard one to get through. It's, it, there's nothing more to it. There really isn't any more to it than a woman having sex with a doll. And then of course, you know, I guess we get a little deeper because she tosses all her religious stuff into the garbage after her because, you know, now she, she loves that sex so much. She can't imagine not having it. And maybe that'll help the doll come back. And I don't know, I felt really gross watching it. And I kind of feel like I I feel like this film should never have been made or it should have been made um, with a different angle to it where this wasn't like the, the sex is so much a part of the film. It's such a major bulk of the film that you can't escape it. Um, it is really hard to sit through. However, I, I am, I'm totally impressed that this guy managed to do it. I think anybody who manages to make the beginning, middle and end of a film and put it out there, you know what? That's awesome. Um, after Turner made this film, it became a cult classic. He had no idea. He knew he was getting like six bucks per film and he'd sold it to Hollywood home video who apparently were basically super exploitative of him, or at least that's what he says. For example, they took out that 70 minutes of film and they replaced the soundtrack without his permission. And he just, he had no idea that basically his films were being rented nonstop at like local video stores. And, um, it was, it was sort of like the prized VHS title. If you could get it for VHS collectors, in fact, even Yale university has a copy of it in their archive. So he just went on to like start up a re a home remodeling business and kind of shifted back over to his other life, started, you know, having a family. Meanwhile, there were rumors that were circulated that was, he was killed in a terrible car wreck. So that kind of added to the lore and it wasn't until 2013. So this movie was made in 84 it wasn't until 2013 that Massacre Video decided they wanted to make a DVD version of this and they hunted him down. And that's when he found out he had this like huge fan base. Um, so he's actually done a little bit of touring with it along with Shirley. They've been going and talking here and there about like the experience of doing it. I, I would say like, I think, I think in theory and on paper, it's got some neat neatness to it as far as, you know, just getting it made. But, um, there's just between the bad music, between the doll, which I think I already don't like dolls. So that doesn't help. Like if you make it a hideous giant puppet man who has sex with somebody, <laughs> it was shot really, really badly. And it's a little difficult to follow what's happening. Um, it's obviously, like I said, I think it's cut straight to VHS. So it's got that kind of like homemade quality, which can be kind of good, but 
for the most part, it feels a little rough around the edges. Like I said, it's clearly a fetish film. I, I had no feeling of redeeming features in the narrative, especially where basically a woman's incomplete without sex, you know, and like, but there's that extra layer that sex, if you have it before marriage, is basically evil. And that like every message in here is just straight up horrible. And then she throws away everything she ever has or cares about for more sex with this thing. And, and then you've got an okay ending. You know, it's just... I don't know. I can't recommend this. I really can't recommend this film. I think that there's probably some amazing films out there, and I'm really stoked to hear about um, Tony and Eric and Kelly's picks because I I do want to explore this um, genre a little bit deeper. But I anyone who wants to get into black exploitation cinema, I would not recommend this. In fact, I would only recommend this film if you want to watch a film about a woman having sex with a doll. That's that's the only thing you're gonna take away from this. So um, that's it for me. I will see you guys next week where I will actually be in the studio with the uh, with the guys. So hold tight, um, stay safe and healthy, everybody out there. And uh, yeah, see you in a week. Uh, okay, so here we are back. Boy, Vanessa. Um, Interesting pick. Not my favorite. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Vanessa, good job. Tony, uh, I know you've probably got a bunch of runners up on this, but can you tell us a little bit <laughs> more? Just uh, anything you want to finish up with on black exploitation? This is clearly something you have a passion for. I, yeah, I mean, these are just uh, these are just when I first started really digging into black exploitation in kind of the mid to late '90s. It was like uh, it, it was like uh, opening up a treasure chest of like. Because you're viewing, even though a fair amount of the there was a fair amount of like white presence behind the camera in some of these movies, they are still, you know, even though even though the worst of them are still like infused with a very distinctive energy that you would not get if they were, you know, your conventional white centered movies. And they're and they run they run the gamut. I mean, I, you know, as far as others that I would say are kind of good, solid pillars to start. I mean, the first shaft is still indisputably solid. Yeah. Um, uh, I had an, an interesting experience. I almost covered Superfly because I had I had saw I saw it for the first time in many many years a week or two ago, and I was struck by how it's really interesting because it is amateurish as hell. And aside from Ron O'Neill's performance as priest in the leading role a lot of the acting is a little bit iffy um, <laughs> and it's very crudely shot. Uh, ironically enough, it's, I think it's directed by Gordon Parks who also directed Shaft, which is a very polished movie. Um, wow. But it also boasts, I would say maybe the greatest uh, like pop rock soul soundtrack of all time in the form of Curtis Mayfield soundtrack for Superfly. It very is true. just that, that movie elevates the film to the level of almost like inner city opera. It is that soundtrack is that potent. Uh, other really good ones that I would highly recommend, um, or good ones, fun ones, Abby, the Black Exorcist ripoff directed by William Girdler. That movie moves like a chicken with its ass on fire. It <laughs> is so fucking hysterical and wonderful. It is very hard to get a hold of. That was just it. In my research, that popped up, and I was like, oh, I'm picking this, and I could not find it. There was a DVD release about 10 or 15 years ago, um, and it was struck from a print that looked like it had been marinating in grape juice for about 10 years. It just looks and sounds awful, but the movie is an absolute kick in the pants. William Marshall, I, it was funny, I many years ago I used to write in a blog and I would do, like, f for October I would do, like, really extensive, like, day after day of extensive essays on, on horror movies. And one day I um, contrasted the exorcism of Emily Rose with, <laughs> with Abby and explained on a point-by-point -point level why Abby is the vastly superior fucking movie. Because, A, again, it moves like a chicken with its ass on fire. <laughs> the hero is not a conflicted priest who ends up accidentally contributing to the, spoiler alert, death of an innocent child. Right. <laughs> this is a badass um, uh, priest in a dashiki played by William fucking Marshall who disgorges his lines in these wonderful Shakespearean tones and basically slaps and disses the demon until it gets the fuck out of the woman who is left safe and sound at the end of the movie. 
it is just an absolute kick in the pants. It is so much fun, and it's overdue for uh, an extended uh, reappraisal. I, I just Factory, wish somebody we're yeah. looking at you. I oh. tell you, man. It's uh, but I have a feeling the the licensing rights are absolute Must be murder, murder, murder. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, all three Shaft movies are fun. You know, it one helped the we've talked about it on the show a couple of times. Or Dolomite, Dolomite is still my name. Made Dolomite yes. a much more entertaining film. Oh, I agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Oh, one other um, uh, huge thumbs up: Cleopatra Jones. Oh yes. yeah, uh, yeah, which was a very close one for me. Uh, I love it's super female centric. Tamara Dobson, charismatic as hell. Literally, the mold was broken when that woman was born. She's like the six foot tall Amazon who wears clothes like nobody's fucking business, high kicks like nobody's business, and the. The villain in the movie is a uh, suicidal uh, or a homicidal drug lord played by Shelley Winters called Mommy. And she is freaking balls to the wall. Incredible in that movie. That Excellent. reminds me so much of, uh, I'm sure you guys both know, uh, Kentucky Fried movie. Oh, yeah. God, yes. That, she's a six-foot-tall black woman from the Amazon. He's a Hasidic Jew. <laughs> Cleopatra <laughs> oh, Schwartz. And, and we kind of, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, I also I think we would be remiss in not mentioning Pam Greer, who's um, yes. like an absolute icon cinematically in general, but definitely an icon of these. You can't go wrong with most of the movies that she did. Um, Coffee is a, a is a fucking gut punch. That movie is actually still super brutal. I I considered that because I I've seen that and I love it, but I thought that maybe everybody had seen that. Yeah. I mean, after uh, Jackie of, Brown yeah, came um, out, you know, her films just kind of exploded again. Absolutely. So I, I, I wanted yeah. to stay away from stuff like that. But yeah, the coffee films and Foxy anything, Brown said, is yeah. amazing. Also, also, Foxy Brown has one of the best soundtracks. Uh, I want to say it's J.J. Jackson did the soundtrack for that. And uh, a, another just freaking. F- and that's the other thing that's wonderful about a lot of these black exploitation movies is they've got the best fucking soundtracks on the planet. Oh, just geez, uniformly. Dude. I mean, you had James Brown doing Black Caesar. There's right. another good one, too. Larry Cohen directed oh, Black oh, Caesar really? with Fred that's Williamson. Right. God, that, that one's yeah. a really that, that is. Was, they were talking about that. In low that budget Cohen, as yeah, shit. D- but but really just again, it has this visceral effectiveness. And, uh, you know. I'll, I'll watch Fred the Hammer Williamson read a fucking phone book, you know. True. The dude is just... And Larry Cohen's just Scorsese trapped in a <laughs> low budget. Oh, I know. You know, he just... He, there's amazing so, director. Yeah, I just... Oh, I'm a huge Larry Cohen fan. And yeah, that I, one's I terrific. I gotta tell too. you guys, you, you brought up Fred Williamson. You better start uh, rent VFW when I'm, you get home. I'm looking forward, yeah, man. I'm looking forward. That. That's one I would like to own a physical copy of if they put it out on DVD or Blu-ray. I'm sure they will, yeah. I think yeah. that I think it's getting mostly solid reviews, so I, I know that there'll yeah. be something on there. It'd be neat if it's got a lot of extras on it. Oh, God. Damn oh, cool. right. Nice. Okay, so, fantastic. This means that I get to choose the next one, and uh, Tony, thank you for playing so much with us. Thank you, uh, thank thank you, you for having me. You'll get a home version of Strange Hands Radio <laughs> to play at home, but you are now being shuffled off, and we'll have Vanessa back next week. And the I'm choice- not too brokenhearted. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll only cry a little bit, and my beer will only have a few middle-aged Horror nerd tears in it. <laughs> <laughs> or this lovely wine, this lovely rosé we've been having. I know. It, it, this, was a, this was a nice uh, breakfast wine, wasn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, you guys, I'm going for something a little weirder this time. And I am picking animation for our genre. And it's got to be kind of genre animation, if you know what I mean. No so, Toy Story. No Toy Story. <laughs> in fact, if you pick Pixar, you better fucking have some really good arguments to back up why you pick a Pixar I mean, film. Pixar is phenomenal. They make great of movies. Of course they are. But. <laughs> Everyone has seen every Pixar film. I want, I want something. It doesn't have to be, you know, something nobody's ever seen. But it's got to be something that, uh, that, that kind of uh, incorporates what Strange Eons Radio is all about. So that's uh, everybody's homework who's playing at home. Again, thank you so much for all the like shares and the uh, posts and reposting everything. Ron Forbeck has gone crazy and uh, (laughs) tagged us in every single thing he's doing. And Ron, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Strange Eon's Army, baby. Hashtag Strange Eon's Army. Danny Williford, as always, Bob, Heather Reesby, everybody, you know, Craig Mullins, uh, just 
texts me in the middle of an episode and says, this is what I would have picked. Stuff like that. And I love seeing that kind of stuff. So if, uh, if we're friends on Facebook, shoot me a message while you're listening to the, to the show. In fact, Nick Gucker, he gave me a live blow by blow when he started watching Robo War. So, so for the next two hours, he was just sending me it was dialogue live, live texting, the live tweeting. Oh, yeah. It's that kind of movie. Hell yes. My buddy Jamie was saying he... Uh, he continually gets stares when he's on his uh, people staring at him, looking and weird when he's listening to us while he's on his uh, treadmill in the gym and stuff. And said so it's it's fairly entertaining. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Thanks, Jamie. We love Jamie. So anyhow, we will be back next week uh, with Vanessa and animation. Oh yeah. Ciao. Our show is recorded somewhere high above Naval Station Everett at the nexus of all realities and is engineered and produced by Eric Margaret. Our theme music is Strange Eons Part 1 by the band Nightshade and is used with permission. Find Strange Eons Radio on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and wherever fine podcasts are found.